Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Gopichan Khatragatta. Um, Dr. Kopitian Katagada is the founder and CEO of Mylan Foundry, an AI company with a vision to transform human experiences and outcomes in wellness, media, and entertainment. He is an independent director of Bosch India Limited. He's also the vice president of IET, Board of Trustees UK, and a member of NASCOM Governing Council for the Center of Excellence for Data Science and AI. Till January 2019, Gopi was the group CTO and innovation head of Tata Sons. He helped grow um, GE's largest R&D center, the John F. Welch Technology Center, to be amongst the world's leaders in intellectual property generation. Gopi is, is the past chairman of CII National Technology Committee and the CII Western Regional Innovation Task Force. Gopi helped establish the Advanced Materials COE at IIT Madras and Advanced Manufacturing COE at IIT Kharagpur. He has framed the CII Tata Communications Digital Transformation COE. Gopi was also set up and managed ongoing Tata research collaborations with Harvard and Yale. Gopi holds a BE degree in electrical engineering from Bangalore University and an MS PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Iowa State University. Um, Dr. Gopi Chen Khatragata. You're, you're on mute. Thanks, Gangadhar. I hope I'm loud and clear. Can you confirm that? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for that introduction. And uh, today I'll be talking about using AI uh, to transform products and services. Uh, and I am happy that I was there for the talk by Rajesh Vasa. And there are areas where you'll see that uh, uh, we think uh, similarly, and there are areas where uh, we might be thinking differently. And that is exactly the nature of a conference to bring together different thoughts and different uh, experiences. Uh, so hopefully this will be interesting, transforming products and services using AI. Uh, so one of the uh, messages I would like to leave uh, with the folks uh, listening in is that AI by itself uh, is not as powerful or it shouldn't be looked at as an isolated technology. It's a tool in a tool set uh, and it should be used as such. And uh, again, AI is a broad connotation for various uh, techniques. So we'll talk about them, but really where it matters is at the intersection of biology, digital and materials and within digital uh, artificial intelligence and in particular these days deep learning uh, is the area of interest is the area where maximum uh, return, maximum bang for the buck is being produced. Still, as part of the industry, the way we look at it is that 80% of what we do with AI, with technology, uh, at the intersection of biology, digital and materials will be driven by the market needs. Uh, so it's critical to understand the current needs very well and also predict uh, the emerging needs and then look at what technologies will solve it. Again, the market needs uh, will be driven to a large extent by trends. So today, if uh, pandemic and social distancing are trends, uh, they will drive uh, areas such as mobility and uh, the ability to operate uh, zero touch solutions and various other aspects of the industrial requirements get uh, impacted. Uh, so that's the nature of how AI will play a role and it shouldn't be looked at in isolation. I do agree with Rajesh that there's a lot of hype on AI and uh, there are a lot of people doing disservice to AI by uh, talking about AI uh, as though it was human intelligence and uh, that it will replace human intelligence and that's where the trouble starts. Uh, human intelligence is pretty complex um, and uh, we have IQ which is uh, significantly ancestrally inherited. Of course, if you don't use it, you will lose it. Uh, sensorially tuned emotional quotients, 
So if you are able to connect with the people around you, connect with emotions, uh, you will have EQ and you will be using it. Uh, if you use your hands on whatever you use your hands, you will have your hand portions tuned and it doesn't just open up the neurons for that particular task. Actually, it opens up neurons uh, for a variety of uh, tasks which are uh, responsible uh, for practical experience being put to use. And then there is bacterial quotient. Bacterial quotient is the intelligence which we get from the environment symbiotically received in our guts, on our skin from the bacteria which reside there. So this is very complex and we use all forms of intelligence at various points in uh, time. AI, on the other hand, is math. It is uh, mathematical. Uh, it could be codified rules. It could be data queried or machine learned. Most of the discussion around AI today is because there has been significant progress in what is machine learned AI, uh, in particular, the advances in neural networks. Uh, and we'll talk about those. Um, so these are tree based uh, uh, or fuzzy logic, similarity queries or deep learning. But there are issues in terms of our understanding of AI because we uh, think about AI in context of the term intelligence. And that's where we lose track uh, because uh, AI today cannot be generically intelligent. Uh, so if a system is developed to differentiate between cats and dogs, then that's what it will do. Uh, there have been attempts to create generically intelligent systems. Uh, GPT-3 is one, but uh, it's nowhere close to being practically usable in any form. So there's a lot of hype caused by those kinds of systems making um, claims for which they're still not eligible for. Uh, so generically intelligent systems are not there yet, and there is no need for them from an industry standpoint. We are happy to use specific AI systems for specific tasks, and we have been using them for quite some time. Uh, so have AI applications, uh, uh, are they there? Of course they are, and I'll show you some of them uh, and uh, hope to convince you that they're being used for quite some time. Uh, AI doesn't have episodic memory. Uh, if I have this discussion today, uh, I don't automatically uh, have this memory in an AI system. It is trained uh, and what it has been trained on is what it remembers. Uh, so even if it is uh, being trained to learn continuously, what is called episodic memory, which is not uh, connected to the function it's being trained for, will not be retained. Whereas we can retain the episodic memory, even though we do not today understand where it will be useful, and later bring it to use uh, for areas where we did not imagine that uh, this memory could be used. There is no emotion. We can program emotion, but as soon as you program something, obviously it is not emotion. Uh, so emotion is spontaneous, if we agree. There's no emotion in AI systems. Uh, so chatbots, if they are claimed to be having emotions that uh, uh, might need to be looked at from a different lens, you can program emotions depending on certain inputs. Uh, but like I said, emotions are spontaneous and they are different depending on different people. Even the people you're interacting with for the same situation, you might have different emotions. So uh, those things are not there in AI today. And creativity, again, can be programmed. Uh, you can program to create a painting similar uh, to a Picasso, um, but you cannot create a new Picasso with a new uh, form of uh, art. Uh, so that's where AI is. And again, uh, for the folks on this conference, uh, maybe this is too fundamental, but uh, still I want to share my perspective that while we have been trying to mimic the biological neuron in artificial neural networks, it's with a limited understanding of the artificial neural networks. So what we have said is that, okay, the neuron collects information and it passes it through a cell body where it uh, passes it through a function and a nonlinearity which is a nonlinearity. So aggregation may be an offset and a nonlinearity. So that's what we mathematically uh, have reproduced in a neuron. So neither the biological neuron nor the math math mathematical neuron have um, significant math going on or uh, it is not the seat of the power of the neural networks. So the seat of the power in both cases is the massive interconnectivity of the neurons. So with this interconnectivity, what you get 
for example, in the mathematical equation shown there, uh, it, at the simplest level, it is ax plus by uh, plus c equal to zero, which is the equation for a line. Uh, so it draws lines in space. Uh, you can think about two dimensional spaces. So if it's cats and dogs, uh, one dimension is maybe the length of the animal and the other dimension is the pitch of the voice. And you can draw a line separating cats and dogs. Um, if it is a more complex problem, you'll have more variables. So you can think about three dimensions and surfaces. But if it is even more complex, you'll have multiple dimensions and surfaces in multi-dimensional multi space. So that's what we are talking about with an artificial neural network in the simplest uh, sense is that it can draw surfaces in multi-dimensional space. So it can separate out categories. It can also morph one surface to another. And uh, there are a set of applications based on that as well. So what is the uh, reason for all the excitement? And it's very valid. Uh, there has been significant progress in three areas. One is natural language processing, the other is voice recognition, and the third is uh, image recognition. And as industry, we take what is there and we use it to the best of the abilities it provides. And that's what I'll be talking about. Uh, so what has changed? In the past, uh, the computational power was not there to be doing some of the algorithms the way we are doing it now. So convolution neural network act automatically extracts features. Previously, we were extracting the features manually. So if there is an image, we would take discrete cosine transforms and uh, choose the first few numbers as a representation of the entire image. But if you have a crack and you want to recognize a crack and you're doing it using discrete cosine transforms, it's not going to work. So what convolution neural network does is based on what your output uh, is supposed to be, it will pick the features it wants by using a convolution technique. So it will have layers which are tuned uh, to look at uh, uh, shadows, shapes, lines, each one of these is a different layer and it can use as many layers as it wants because uh, it has no computational restriction. And then there is a max pooling layer and then again you have the conventional neural network, uh, deep uh, neural network in this case. So it's nothing but uh, similar to a multi-layer perceptron, but in this case you can go with any number of layers. Previously we used to stop at three layers because we said once we have surfaces in multi-dimensional spaces, uh, any further layers do not offer me too much. And so uh, we would, uh, for mathematical simplicity, keep it to three layers. Today, for even the smallest additional classification or additional improvement in output, uh, we will go for additional uh, layers. So that's what has changed and that's where the excitement is. So people will talk about AI in the fullest definition, which is okay, uh, but really this is where the progress has been. And in particular, like I said, in the last three bullets, or what I'm showing here, natural language uh, processing. If you have used, uh, uh, if you have used the ability to uh, transcribe, for example, that is natural language processing, um, or if you, if your system is able to detect a sentiment uh, in uh, Twitter, it's natural language processing. Voice recognition is uh, extensively used um, and image recognition is extensively used today. Anybody who uses Facebook will be uh, surprised at the quality of the recognition uh, despite the angles and so on and so forth. And various other aspects of industrial use cases have been used uh, for quite some time. Um, and the issue was that uh, AI was not being provide was not providing a complete solution, and this is where when we talk about industrial IoT or uh, provide AI solutions uh, for uh, connected infrastructure in a power plant, uh, the language being used was that we will connect your uh, equipment, we will connect your sensors, and we'll provide all those reports, and that doesn't really cut it uh, in the industry. What is the problem that you're solving? Uh, are you going to reduce the boiler tube failures? And are you going to provide an end-to-end -end solution? Now, that's where the earlier discussion comes in handy, that it is not about AI by itself. AI has a role to play, a significant role to play, um, and can do it better than other approaches, maybe if you're using deep uh, neural networks on a thermal image, for instance. Um, however, there are other techniques which need to also 
complement uh, AI for providing a complete uh, solution. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that the industrial uh, organizational structures have not been designed uh, to um, take in AI in this uh, form. There are IT departments who do not talk to data science department, uh, who do not talk to the operations department. So in the industrial context, you go to the data science department and give them an AI solution. It's not going to cut it. So this needs to happen at a leadership level, and this needs to happen at a system level, and this needs to happen at an intersection of uh, technologies. So there's a lot more coming up uh, with the capabilities AI are going to provide in uh, video, including recommendation engines, uh, which are based on not only metadata of what you've used, but actual content, uh, lighting and characters and voice and music of what you've watched. Um, and of course, photorealistic smart, smart chatbots are there. We need to take it with the pinch of salt, but today you can have a chatbot who is trained to be your CFO uh, because much of the knowledge of a CFO can be programmed into a chatbot to give you the appropriate answers. Uh, but uh, really, uh, are you ready uh, to do something like that? That's a question that we'll have to answer. So various other areas are going to be benefited by uh, AI, including health and wellness. Uh, there was a question earlier on health. Um, I do agree that uh, the uh, doctors and the radiologists are still in the loop. So if you're going to recognize a tumor using AI, uh, the radiologist uh, will have to still uh, provide his final uh, go ahead. But there are areas most recently with COVID with the volumes of data which needed to be looked at to look at the difference of an X-ray, uh, which is caused by uh, pneumonia versus COVID. Those are things very well suited for AI to go through volumes of data on a pandemic like situation and extract those pieces of information which require further doctor uh, attention. And of course, wellness, uh, there are certain advantages to be working in wellness, and I'll talk about that as well, and various other uh, areas. Again, um, need to think about it at a system level. AI uh, is great. Uh, if you can bring it to the edge, it's even more fantastic. AI training will happen in the cloud, uh, but inferencing, if you want to cast to avoid an accident, needs to occur at the edge. Uh, there is no sense of the data and uh, the decisions going back to the cloud and then coming back to the cars. That's not going to work. Uh, but with uh, AI for unstructured data, which is AI for video, AI for audio and vibration data and so on, and the fact that neural compute is at the edge uh, and the 5G, 5G has arrived, it'll take a couple more years for 5G to be what its promise is. Uh, today in even developed countries, 5G is not uh, what it can be. It's just emerging out of uh, 4G and maybe even 3G even. But what it will really benefit is the machine to machine connectivity and being able to uh, take decisions without having to go back to some kind of a central uh, scenario. Just wanted to show you a few cases of where uh, AI uh, can be and is being used um, beyond the traditional uh, thought processes um, of uh, characterization or classification or recognition. Here's an example. I can take a particular resolution in this case 180p and make it 1080p because like I said, I can have layers and at each layer train it to get better and better at uh, interpolating between two pixels. So I've taken and increased the number of pixels by 36 times in this uh, video. Sorry. So the advantage of doing something like this, and we have done this in our company, is to be able to transmit a lower resolution, a lower quality video, and get a higher resolution, higher quality video on your phone, which means that uh, my transmission costs are reduced, my bandwidth costs are reduced, my experience is also uh, increased. Uh, Again, uh, face recognition was uh, talked about by Rajesh and there's an example of what we can do because there is a database of 3 million faces and because it's multiracial uh, and because there's also a trained neural network already which can be used and you can just use the outermost layer to create an index for a new uh, image. Uh, you can 
pretty much start using this uh, straight of the bat. Uh, so the previous example, we had to develop it in-house, we had to make it available at the edge, we had to program uh, for performance, including low power, 30 frames per second at the edge. In this case, uh, there, there, there are applications you can think of where uh, you get one image of an individual and you can start recognizing that individual already, no training required because there's a pre-trained network and it produces not a classification, but an index because the last layer is chopped off. So this index image was very well recognized. Uh, again, uh, to the earlier point, there were errors. There were two errors. Oh, no, sorry. There was one error in this entire uh, uh, team image uh, where they were not trained for. It didn't uh, recognize it labeled as unknown. Uh, but one of the uh, ladies got mislabeled as a gentleman in this uh, picture. Everything else was labeled uh, correctly. Um, so this is the state of the art. Are there applications which can do the use this well? Yes. If there is an error because of a single index image, you can use multiple index image and get a better quality of the classification. Uh, there are uh, races for which this database is not sufficient. So you have to bolster uh, the data for those uh, races. Uh, so these are all practical things and we can find applications where uh, you can use this effectively as an example in surveillance uh, cameras for attendance taking and all done in with the sense of data privacy and only uh, after informing people as an example if you want to detect who is going into an area for which you need a training to be in that area uh, you better have uh, an ability to make sure that the individual going in has that kind of a training and these applications, if it is flagged that an individual is going in without training, a uh, supervisor will come and take a look. And if once in uh, 25 images, there is an error, maybe uh, he can just uh, live with it, flag it, it will retrain, uh, do better the uh, next time. So you can't use it for uh, an application like an aircraft engine and if it is going to fail because of a misclassification, those are not the applications you want to use it at this point of uh, time. Uh, you can use it for detecting people using ads pertinently, detecting uh, text and using ads pertinently. You can use it for detecting and transcribing low resource languages uh, for various purposes. And uh, these are all applications in the field already and we do it as well. And yes, an application is into the future, but we've already done the um, and the patent has been awarded now. Uh, so what uh, what we're doing here is taking non-invasive measures and mapping it to what would typically be obtained only through uh, blood samples or salivary samples. So C-reactive protein, uh, serum proteins and salivary cortisol or blood cortisol are obtainable through blood tests or saliva. In either case, it goes to a lab. Uh, so these are things which you can do during the clinical trial, take the blood test, take the non-invasives and create a neural network which will map the non-invasives into the uh, blood tests and salivary tests. And we do not use the uh, output of the neural network one strain to say this is your C-reactive protein number. Uh, it will not work in that manner. What will be suitable at this stage of development is that you use the C-reactive protein to detect acute inflammation or trends in acute inflammation, serum protein to detect trends in chronic inflammation, cortisol to detect trends in uh, stress. And over a large volume of data, you'll be able to get to a good state in terms of thinking about inflammation and uh, stress. And we have done clinical trials with limited data and it shows promise. Is there work to be done? Significant amount. But we, is this something that we hope will get us to wellness? Absolutely, you bet. Uh, again, from an AI at the edge standpoint, uh, uh, the uh, difficulty is to be able to do AI on low compute. And uh, the trick is to do the inferencing on low compute. Even then, you have to use the entire environment to the best of its uh, ability. Uh, and this is an example in the industrial automation task. Uh, use case, but you can do it for automotive and uh, various other aspects. By doing it at the edge, you will be able to provide outcomes which um, will be able to uh, uh, solve some of the current problems with AI. 
So I'll end with this uh, chart and uh, maybe still have uh, time for a couple of uh, questions. When you're looking at AI for your products and services, uh, first of all, I should answer the question, should you? I think you should. Uh, today, uh, you should have AI and in particular deep learning uh, in your thought process, uh, just as you should have uh, digital transformation in your uh, thought process. So how do you go about doing it? Uh, you look at what data you already have, or you can generate that you have unique access to. Um, and uh, that will form and inform your AI uh, strategy. What manual decisions uh, and intelligence that are required today in your businesses that take significant labor and time. If somebody is sifting through volumes of, let's say, uh, satellite images to mark uh, objects in those satellite images, which is a use case we have solved uh, for a national security case, that is uh, not the right way to do it. Number one, the, uh, the errors will be more even. We can take the gold standard and reproduce it uh, with a better uh, classification rate than if you take all the possible people who are doing that over the time that uh, they're doing that because everybody doesn't do it as good as the gold standard individual. But we can come close, not as good maybe, but come close to the gold standard individual. Um, are there aspects of intelligence that can be captured by voice sound, image, or video. Uh, these are areas where most progress has been made. You should be thinking about it. If you have CCTV cameras, for example, um, you, you, I don't think you should be having people watch it day and night. Uh, you can have uh, AI techniques uh, do that definitely for detecting intrusion and possibly also looking at uh, 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 policy violations on environment, health and safety. Can you de detect people wearing masks or not wearing masks where they should be or other PPE equipment? You absolutely can. In remote areas, uh, you can't have people sitting and watching this uh, and today you don't have to. You can fuse together multiple sensors and pro provide system level information. If you have a need to do that, AI will do that well for you. Uh, and also you need to think of new ways. When I presented the wellness use case, it's a totally new case, leveraging AI, leveraging new sensors, leveraging the availability of compute on mobile uh, phones. So if you're only doing it to recognize tumors in MRI and CT, which I have done uh, as part of the uh, roles I played at uh, GE, for example, it's a good start, but that's not uh, where uh, we should end because there are regulations there and more than the technology, it's the regulations which will hinder. There are people set in doing it in a particular way and more than technology, that's what will hinder the implementation of the capabilities of uh, AI. There, the only place where you will be able to make quick progress is in a pandemic-like situation and you have to deal with hundreds and thousands of uh, images. Uh, again, you need to think about whether there's an advantage of performing AI inferencing at the edge versus the cloud training. You will do it on the cloud for anything of uh, significance, uh, but inferencing, you can do it at the edge uh, for most of the applications. Like I said, we have done it even for video at 30 frames per second on low compute. So that's what I had in terms of a presentation. Happy to take maybe one or two questions if there are. Um, hi, Dr. Gopichand. Uh, we do have one question from the audience. Um, can you tell us about a failure story from your experience where AI was planned to be used, but it did not work out? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, like I said, uh, Gangadhar, the uh, AI in its various forms, including neural networks, have been used for a long time. I was funded for my master's uh, by NASA to use uh, AI, uh, along with developing the sensors, which were eddy current sensors, to inspect the space shuttle main engine uh, tubing. So 1990, we're talking about. So since then, um, uh, the applications have been many. Uh, successes have been few. Failures have been uh, many. Only now, the successes are more or less, we know where we will succeed. Right. One example of an area where we knew how to do it uh, and it didn't still work out, even though the technology was there and provided, was in the area of uh, gas pipeline inspection. 300,000 um, miles of gas pipeline, oil and gas pipeline in the US alone. 
And the way it is inspected is by putting in a pig, a pipeline inspection gauge into the pipe and it will travel 100 uh, miles approximately by the product pushing it. So you put it in and the oil or gas will push it through 100 miles. It's collecting data. Depending on the pig, it could be magnetic flux leakage or it could be ultrasound. Uh, primarily, these are the two techniques which are used. Um, and then what was done is the uh, data would be stored. It would go to a central location. It would be downloaded and uh, it would be printed out and it would be spooled. If somebody would do this looking at the data. So we are talking now about 1996. So the digital uh, digitalization of that meant that uh, they were able to view it digitally, fantastic. Um, but they were still uh, doing it manually. There is no improvement if you're viewing it on a screen and using the space bar to spool through the data and still marking things manually. We used AI, we could recognize um, the defects where uh, we needed to recognize. Uh, we would also recognize uh, other features such as, for example, welds, such as uh, offshoot of the pipeline and so on and so forth. Um, but it never got used because it didn't do it 100% of the time because we didn't have 100% of the data to train it. I believe that it could have been used for the 80% that it was giving the outcomes. But the industry doesn't have, uh, usually accept solutions which are not when I say 100%, I'm not saying that it's right the 100%, uh, but it covers the 100%, right? So that's an example of something which didn't happen then. Even now, I won't be surprised if I go into the op operation center, somebody is sitting and hitting the space bar and spooling through the data. You're on mute, Ganga. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Gopichan, um, for your valuable time and sharing your experience with us. Um, so it's great to understand and see um, what all we can see going forward using AI, uh, especially in wellness is something that really opened my eyes. Thank you. Thank you. Um,